So we finally got a chance to sit again with Mr. Lori Ayers. I've been waiting for this since last week. Um, we've had two conversations so far. Um, they've been fascinating for Yasin and I. Um, the first conversation was really about um, classical ideas of um, Chinese medicine. And we discussed um, how that gets applied to uh, some cases. Um, and then our second conversation was really focused on formulas, um, their design, uh, their um, effectiveness, why that is, and some comparative uh, formula talk. Um, and a thread that has been running through all of these things is the necessity of understanding proper physiology uh, from a classical perspective. Um, and that, of course, led us immediately to the question of uh, diagnosis. Um, and so today's conversation is going to be about diagnosis. Um, and the first question that we have for Lori is, mm, we know from the conversations that we've had previously that there's a particular emphasis in the uh, Tian lineage on the pulse. Um, so if you could tell us a little bit more about that, what's the significance of the pulse in the Tian lineage? Is it more than in, in um, TCM, say? Um, and why is this something that works uh, better, more effective, more efficient for the practitioner or for the patient? Yeah, um, yeah. thank you. Uh, I mean, that's, uh, yeah, it's kind of quite a big question. I mean, I'd sum it up with saying that the pulse is kind of, is the main aspect of the Tian lineage. That's that's kind of its um, that's what it revolves around, really. Because as we discussed last time, it's a clinical lineage primarily. Um, so the even though you know it's very much based on the Shankan lineage, it's very very systematic and it's very kind of true to the lines of the Shankan lineage and the theory of the Shankan lineage and the theory is outlined in the Neijing. The, it all basically comes down to clinical practice, clinical application, and that clinical application revolves around around pulse diagnosis. So, I think we talked last time about Dr. Tien, who's um, you know sort of the patriarch of the lineage. Um, he would see two to three hundred patients a day um, for about age eighteen, maybe a bit later, up until the you know pretty much day that he died at age ninety eight, and he would just. That's how he would do it. Patients, there'd be a queue of patients. Patient would sit down, tell them what their main issue was. Um, he would feel the pulse, ask one or two questions, tell one of his students a formula, they'd go and mix it, and then the next patient would sit down. And it was he'd feel, you know, roughly 50 beats each side. So he'd spend, you know, just a few minutes with each patient. It was very much like, a, you know, sort of high turnover thing. Um, and it was the pulse that allowed him to get very, very quickly to a not just a diagnosis, but a treatment. And um, we often refer to, to the use of the pulse as post diagnosis. Um, but I've often, in the TN lineage, I've often used the term post prescribing rather than post diagnosis. And this comes back to the, the principle that the, the classical principle that the treatment is the diagnosis, because the the exact formula that you're using is determined by by the dysfunction occurring in the body you know say for example if you have let's let's start with the guajia tank you know as everything does in the shankanland um you know that's what would be you know nowadays termed as a taiyang wind cold you know there's a person who sort of constitution is already tending to a bit of blood deficiency so that their yang really tends to float their surface is already warm and open they're hit from the outside by wind which basically means they're protected for the, the layer of warm air around the surface of their body is dispersed so the surface of their body cools off more yang floats up creating a fever and they start to sweat their surface dries out you know they get body aches uh, um a little bit of fever with aversion to wind and aversion to wind because their surface is wet so they can feel air moving over their surface um you know a bit of tightness of the neck now, you prescribe Guajitang for that, not because Guajitang treats the, those symptoms of body aches and so on, but because Guajitang is what resurrects that physiological function that's been knocked out. So we don't even bother calling that a tying wing cold. We call it a Guajitang pattern. Because again, as we talked about last time, the, the fundamental herb methods in Guajitang is what supports, is what provides what the body needs in terms of 
a combination of flavor and temperature to support the function that's being knocked out. So those herbs essentially replace the physiology that's being damaged or support it until it can continue to its full strength by itself. So that then becomes a greater tang pattern. So again, our, our treatment is our diagnosis, not because it's symptomatic based, but actually more because it is based on supporting physiology. The next step is how do we get to a greater tang? Well, you'd have a specific pulse for greater tang. So when somebody comes in and they come in and say, oh, I don't know, like I've, I've started having, you know, some, some stiff neck lately, you'd feel the pulse, you'd feel a pulse indicative of greater tang. And then you would say, you know, have you been feeling sensitive to drafts or have you been sweating a bit more? They say, yes, that confirms a greater tank. So you don't even need to go through the step of going through a load of questions and then saying, well, these are the signs and symptoms of tying wind cold. So therefore I need, you know, pungent, warm tonification of wood to generate fire, to warm the small intestine, to build the blood of Tai Yang, and then sour astringing of the fluids in the surface, so the person's sweating, so therefore I'm going to need pungent warm grade in a one-to-one -one ratio with um, Bai Shao, and then I'm going to need pungent um, Sheng Zheng to sweat fluids out to the surface, and that's going to need to be in a one-to-one -one ratio with, with Bai Shao as well. That Sheng Zheng Bai Shao combination really important for moderating um, the sweating response. No, you're not going to do any of that. You're just going to say, this is a greater tank pulse. So this is a greater tank method. So it becomes a method of pulse prescribing. And you you almost reverse engineer based on what is on the pulse. That then tells you what the, the pathological mechanism is. So it kind of takes out those those steps of diagnosing the majority of, of um, patients. Not, not so much the steps of diagnosis, but more that having to go through that process of creating a, a piecing together a complex diagnosis, then a treatment strategy, then treatment methods, and then reaching a formula. It just takes you straight to that formula. It takes you straight to the endpoint, And that's what makes it such a kind of really quick and efficient um, system of treatment. Yeah, thank you. Um, that the idea of reverse engineering is um that's 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 very on point um we we want to move on to um uh so why the pulse is as opposed to other methods of of diagnosis um um i mean there are i mean one hears about tongue diagnosis mm -hmm. you know there's talk of the patient's subjective experience of of their illness and so on but so in in the tian lineage why specifically the pulse yeah, um, I mean, as you say, there are many, many different um, methods of diagnosis. So I'll just run run through. And there's kind of nowadays it's often you know they're said to be the four pillars of diagnosis, which include looking or observation, um, asking, which basically means talking to the patient. Um, I think listening and smelling, you know, using your other senses, like listening to the tone of their voice, the, the sound, the, the strength of their voice, the, you know, smelling the odors from the body. Um, and then palpation, which can include palpation of the pulse. And this can be pulses in different places. You know, the radial artery, the one on the wrist here is the most common, but you get other, what other pulses like the, um, the Ren Ying pulse, you know, in the neck here, you get um, Fu Yang pulse on the top of the foot, um, Tai Chi pulse, you know, the inside of the ankle. So there's lots of different locations where you can take the pulse depending on the system you practice. Then you can also have palpation of the abdomen. Um, you can have palpation of the skin in general, feeling the tone and the temperature of the skin in different areas. Um, there are even systems where you palpate the course of the channels. So there's lots of different methods. Um, but why the pulse specifically? Well, the the pulse you see is very prominent in classical texts especially the shank and learn is this is because the ultimately the heart is known as the emperor in in chinese medicine so you know there's a lot of these um, again the theory of chinese medicine is or the classical theory of chinese medicine is the same theory that was applied to many different areas of, of life you know political governance to um agriculture and so on so the sometimes the organs of the body are kind of given certain um names you know as as, as people would have roles in society so like the lungs of the prime minister 
um, you know, the heart's the emperor, and heart is seen as the emperor because it's the most important thing in the body. If you know, if the emperor dies, the country dies, the country falls into complete disorder. So the heart is the most important organ for very, very obvious reasons. It's the source of yang. It's the source of the fundamental function which keeps you alive, which is the heartbeat. Um, the Shanghan Lun is a yang-based system. It's based around function. It's based around the maintenance of correct body function and specifically the maintenance of correct body temperature, which allows all body functions to exist. And the pulse basically gives you a direct assessment of function. So you're, you're listening directly to the emperor and what is affecting the emperor, what is affecting the heart in the body, because every other function in the body is there just to support the heart. Um, so you're listening to that directly and you're listening to where the yang is in the body, how the yang is being affected. Um, and you're also getting very much sort of real time information. You know, the pulse can change very quickly. It's very, very reactive. So you get a very, very clear idea of what is going on right now. But that will always be in the context of that person's constitution. So if they tend to have a deep faint pulse, even if they get up and go and sprint uphill, their pulse may speed up and become a bit more forceful, but it will only become as fast and as forceful as it can be in the context of their body. So you're getting very, very immediate feedback of what the body needs addressing on a functional level at this moment in time, but in the context of their constitution. Um, and the, the pulse gives you such a wide range of information. And a really key thing is that it allows you to get straight to the point of the mechanism of what's going on behind the patient's symptoms because patients can report symptoms to you but it's not always that easy to work out the mechanism of what's going on from the patient's reporting of symptoms the pulse takes you very very quickly to the reason for those symptoms which is kind of you know brings us back to what china's person always claims to do claims to treat the underlying pathology not the symptoms or treating you know, the, the person, not not the disease. And that's what the pulse tells you very, very quickly. Um, it allows you to very, very quickly work out whether this is an excess or deficient pattern, whether it's hot or cold, whether it's exterior or interior, um, which sometimes is easy to work out from symptoms and sometimes is very, very difficult to work out from symptoms. But the pulse takes you there very quickly. You know, the, the Neijing says the superior doctor first differentiates yin from yang. And this means, you know, yin disease from yang disease, a disease which is excess, more exterior in the hollow organs versus a disease which is more um, yin, more deficient, more interior, more in the solid organs. And the pulse will take you there immensely quickly, whereas that's not always easy from someone's symptoms. Um, you, can, you can tell that in most patients, you know, within a few seconds of putting your fingers on the pulse. So it's, it gives you that very, very quick feedback. My brother... Um... My brother uh, was uh, treated by you once, mm. um, and I was also treated by you uh, once. And uh, we had a conversation a couple of days ago about the feeling that we had as patients um, when you were taking our pulse. Mm. And I was trying to search um, for the right word, and I could not find it. And my brother said, uh, I got the sen sense that it was a sort of translation. And I thought that was really interesting. And I asked him why. And he said, well, I could tell him that I have bloating, but it's almost as if until he felt my, my pulse, he didn't really know what bloating meant. Like, where is this bloating coming from? What is the mechanism behind it? And I just found it interesting that, that just as patients, uh, we can sort of we can sense that in the in the clinic um is that sort of uh, a good way to think about it yeah yeah exactly because um yeah so if a patient comes in with bloating there are certain questions you can ask which can help get you in a certain direction and sometimes it is very clear um you know you can ask the location you can ask whether it's constant whether it comes and goes whether it's painful on pressure you can then ask about the bowels and so on and all of those can help get you in the right direction. And some of those questions are quite important. But until you feel the pulse, you, you won't necessarily be as sure of what the mechanism behind that bloating is. Because you could have bloating because, you know, you have a lot of heat and dryness in the, in the interior, which is, you know, drying up the stool. So a lot of air gets trapped behind that. It can be a real excess condition. 
or you can have that same kind of really pronounced bloating because the interior is really cold and contracted so no gas can move out and then a patient you know a lot of patients and this comes down to maybe something we'll talk about in a minute about why it's important to use to have diagnostic methods which aren't necessarily reliant on the patient's reporting um but the, the majority of patients wouldn't necessarily be able to answer the kind of questions that the practitioner needs to ask because why would they ever think about that kind of information why would they ever inspect their body's function in that way like you just you just don't think about most of the things and especially when it comes to you know the holistic nature of chinese medicine somebody comes in with a headache and you say do you have a daily bowel movement they'll be like well what's what on earth has that got to do with my head you know they they may just not pay attention to it that much some people may be really on it some people may not so some of the key questions you want to ask about you know whether that's bloating is excess or deficient or so on the patient may not know the answer they may not be able to convey it to you properly um the post will get you there very quickly yeah and it's yeah it's exactly that you're trying to just translate what the the pulse is saying correlating it with with the primary issue the patient presents and um Put that all together so here's a here's the thing that I've, I've always wondered about um and i'd like to discuss this as two almost separate issues on the one mm. hand um there's this sort of uh there's the question of why is the pulse i mean the basic question is why is the pulse doing anything right like uh, but I think there's a general component to that and a specific component to that. And I think even in relation to other systems of medicine that use the pulse. The first one is generally why is the pulse doing something? So when we say, oh, it's wiry or it's floating or whatever, that's kind of, a, I think, a statement about just the pulse in general. Is it high? Is it low? Is it thin? Is it wide? Um, so let's just start there and then I'll, I'll follow up with the second question. In the Tian lineage or in Chinese medicine in general, why would the pulse be doing these different things? Like, can we have an example of why the pulse would be wiry, for example? What's happening in the body to make the pulse wiry when somebody's liver is acting up or whatever? Mm, yeah. Um, I'll maybe come on to wiry in a second. Like, an easier one to start off with maybe be why it floats or why it doesn't. So, say if you get an external condition. And you start to develop a fever you you could have what's called a floating pulse or more superficial pulse basically where the the pulse is felt much more prominently on the surface and then beyond that you know depending on different systems definitions of floating because definitions vary according to different pulse systems so you know some people may agree or disagree with certain definitions i'm using um, just because of a difference in system but basically a floating pulse when you feel very much at the surface and then the second thing is often when you push it you push through it quite quickly so with a little bit of pressure you push through the the vessel almost so there's no more you no longer feel the bead the reason that could happen is when you're generating a fever <clears throat> you're basically your body basically moves a lot of blood to surface creates a lot of vasodilation of the vessel that's surface to warm the surface and that's shown in the artery here dilating and actually moving closer to the surface so you physically feel it close to the surface when you get more cold on the surface you get more vasoconstriction the vessels would actually literally contract and pull down into the interior so you'd get deeper pulses and then that brings us on to wiry tight um, and so on because wiry is a again this is this is where descriptions between systems will vary greatly um but i don't think anyone can argue that wiry falls under the the, the category of, of a finding of tension on the wall of the vessel specifically tension it comes into a really thin point like you know one of the high pitched strings on a guitar when you press onto it it really cuts into your finger and that's kind of how we describe a wiry pulse now like I say other systems may use terminology differently um again that's that's a pulse of kind of contraction of the walls of the vessel it's a pulse which it's a yin pulse it's associated with stagnation specifically stagnation of fluids um, in the system so when you get a stagnation of fluids in the system you get a pressurizing of the space and a pressurizing of contracted space can cause a feeling of tension on the vessel um other things you could have for example you know you could have a system where the heart is really in overdrive you know say somebody with a lot of like adrenaline pulsing through the system their pulse is really really racing that can 
make the heart, you know, the pulse feel really forceful, make the vessel expand, make it feel very big, push it up higher in the body. Or the opposite, when somebody's system is almost kind of like under functioning, um, you know, it can mean there's there's less actual force through the the whole system in general. So that can lead to the pulse becoming very, very deep and almost faint. It doesn't beat strongly against your fingers. The flip side is you could have somebody say, for example, with, I don't know, like pulse doesn't correlate with blood pressure very well, but just for an example, you could say the previous one, maybe somebody, you know, maybe, maybe some people would start to correlate that with low blood pressure or something. That's not necessarily a direct correlation, but say you could have a patient with, say, high blood pressure coming in but still have a very deep tight pulse because there's an external force causing vasoconstriction constriction of the vessel so that creates an increase of pressure inside the vessels but the pulse itself is very deep and has a lot of tension on the vessel because and that would then tell us that's an outwards constricting force creating pressure inside the vessels so you can have a lot of different elements which go into creating differing pulse findings but a lot of it has to do i mean you can kind of divide them up into a number of this different categories, like the force of the beat, when you actually go down and find the force, how hard that beat pressing against your fingers, the depth, the the how deep you have to press before you meet the beating of the pulse. And again, different systems, some systems take two depths, like the, the depth at which you first meet the pulsation, and then the depth at which you stop meeting it. We only sort of take one in this system, but then you can have, you know, the tension on the vessel, whether there's a lot of tension and the feel of that tension, where there's absolutely no tension. You can have the feeling of the flow through the vessel. It can feel like the blood is almost like slipping across, like the, the beat is almost slipping across your fingers, or like it's a little bit rough. It's almost not missing beats, but it's verging on that irregularity. It's like not an even distance between beats. Um, so you can have many different kind of categories of finding, but they're all they're all brought about by changes in the pressurization of the vascular system, the change in how, um, you know, the, the movement of the vessels with physical movement of the vessels within the, within the body. Um, yeah, there's a lot of different facts that can go into it. And that's always going to be related to other factors in the body because the heart is always related to other factors in the body. Yeah, exactly. It's all about getting healthy, warm, oxygenated blood to tissues. Um, that's. And so you're generally sort of sleuthing out what's happening in various bits of the body by seeing their reflection in what the, what the heart is doing in these vessels. Yeah. Okay. The other thing that I think is kind of interesting is this is this idea that there are different positions and in each one of these different positions, there's a correlation within with an organ, even if we understand that organ as in the Chinese sense that we were talking about last time as a sort of hook for a set of like functional relationships. Why would, I mean, it's one artery, right? Like you're feeling this one artery and yet different things are happening at different places on that artery. And I'm not even disputing that because even I can feel that the top mm. of that artery, like on my, on my left wrist is uh, just kind of thinner than it is farther down. And I know that that's not the case in my son, for example. Mm -hmm. um, why, how does that, is there an explanation for how that correlation happens? Or is it just simply an empirical thing where over time through trial and error, we've just been like, well, when this is happening, this is happening in the body and that's it. Yeah, um, I mean, there's a few points there. Like the first, so when you say positions correlate with organs, I know some people will, will jump on this. <laughs> and um, I don't blame you for saying that at all, because a lot of people assume that. But in, in the classics, I I was talking to a colleague about this the other day who had done a lot of, you know, a lot of research into this. But the correlation with the organs isn't as clearly outlined in the classics as as we commonly refer to. It's definitely correct in terms of how you use the pulse to say that but often the correlation between the different positions is often anatomical correlation with chest abdomen lower abdomen or so on um, and also correlation with certain elements and then we go on to correlate that with organs so but i you know what you essentially say about correlating with organs that's absolutely correct about how we speak about it how we how we use it clinically but it's more that we kind of abstract from a correlation with an anatomical location elemental function and so on that we then reach the organ correlation so you're absolutely correct in saying that but if we're being really really strictly classical 
there will be certain people who say that that's not actually mentioned in the classics. So I thought I should just should just mention that. But you're you're absolutely correct, and I will also refer to pulses in in the way of correlating to organs as well. But as long as we sort of understand where that comes from. Um, so first of all, for, you know, for people who aren't familiar with this, the pulse, like I said, there's lots of different locations you can take the pulse from, but the most common one is the radial artery. So um, just basically here, um, the artery which runs up here over thumb through the um, through the wrist here. And we generally take it most commonly with three fingers. One goes into the sort of wrist crease here. The other one goes onto the styloid process, basically the big bulge in the radius that you feel here. And the other one falls behind it. And these are three positions known as Sun Guan and Chu. And this is, this is using the idea of what we call a microsystem, which is using one small part of the body to represent the greater body as a whole. And you see these all over Chinese medicine, like on the abdomen, you can see it as well, where some systems have like the upper abdomen showing more the upper body, the middle of the abdomen showing more the middle body lower it's the lower body you know you see people using finger diagnosis ear diagnosis you know all different micro systems but the pulse is one of the most common ones and then you have these three positions known as you know the tun which is the position the most distal position one basically in sort of in the wrist crease guan on the styloid process sure the one basically behind the styloid process again different systems may locate those slightly differently but as long as you are fully um, clear on what your system's doing, then that's sort of fine. Now, the these, like we're saying, I'm, I'm going to use the shorthand which we use because it's easier. These correlate with certain organs and certain systems. So on the left hand side, the left hand side, from a Tian lineage perspective, shows more Yang. It shows the the most proximal position, shows the water element or kidney bladder. Um, the middle position over the style of process shows liver, gallbladder, or wood element. The most distal one, heart, small intestine, or fire element. And then on the right hand side, you have lung, large intestine, metal element. Um, the next one over the styloid process shows the earth element, stomach, spleen. The lower one, we would say, shows more ministerial fire, kind of pericardium, sand gel. Other systems would split that into right and left kidney, you know, the right and left true positions, most proximal positions. And you can see that's kind of a correlation with the body. If you hold the hand like this, you know, upper body, middle body, lower body. The turn often associates with the chest, the guan often with the abdomen, digestive organs, the chur, lower abdomen, and lower body. Um, so that's sort of the basis. Now, often we would look at, sometimes the pulse can be uniform across all three positions, but more often than not, you're looking at differences between those positions, and that will give you an idea of the function of the body. So now I can finally come to your question. Why are there changes? Um, physically, why there are changes, there's, there's an anatomical component. So the, the, the vessel does go anatomically deeper into the body as you move more, um, more proximal, closer to the trunk of the body. And it does rise up more as you move more distal. And that's, you know, partly just because it's anatomical, there's more flesh as you go deeper in and vessels get more protected as they go deeper in. Also, the styloid process, that will physically push the pulse up. When you get into the wrist crease, there's actually a bit of a dip, like basically that, you know, styloid process goes down, you have a bone here. So you have a bit of a dip here where the vessel can go in. But because the vessel is then continuing up onto the wrist here, that can lift the vessel a bit. So there can be anatomical reason. There should be a bit of a slope, naturally, like a healthy pulse. You should feel a bit more superficial towards the hand. And as you get towards the true, the most proximal position, it should actually feel a bit deep. So your fingers should form a natural slant downwards. And if they don't, that already shows a pathological tendency. Um, now, you can actually get very big differences, though. So you could have, for example, a position where the middle position, the guan position, stands out really big. The other two are really deep or the first position is really up, and then the others are deep, or, you know, all different configurations of this. From a Chinese medical perspective, we can give explanations, and that would basically be our diagnosis. Now, from a, an actual mechanistic point of view, why certain things happen, I can't give a full explanation of that, and I've never really looked into it. And I actually don't know if somebody has formed a full um, answer to that. I'd be I'd be really interested to read if if they have. Um, <clears throat> for me, it's not 
important to know that. I would be interested in knowing it, but I'm not going to kind of divert my time to that because that would be time away from learning diagnosis formulas and so on. It'd be really interesting to know, but the important thing is just like if I want to be a good driver of a car, I don't actually need to know how to fix an engine to be able to drive a car well. It may be supplemental informa information. So like if I was an F1 driver, I should spend all of my time learning to drive really fast and my mechanics didn't work out what's going on under the bonnet, you know? So I'm, yeah. I would be really interested if somebody wrote a really good article and did some research, I'd be really interested in reading their findings and somebody may have done, but I don't know the actual reasoning behind that, but I know how to use those those differences in findings. Right. This is this this was that was really for me. It was the thing that I, um, you know, because I I I tend to agree. Right. I, it's either you have a theoretical understanding of a thing, or you have an empirical understanding of the thing. And for me, the empirical understanding of the thing is probably more relevant to, like, I mean, as a patient, mm -hmm. I, I'd rather have somebody who just knows what those pulses mean. Um, and I think it's particularly interested in light of what you were interesting in light of what you were saying about those pulses in the Tian lineage correlate actually to herbs or herb methods, actually. Mm, yeah. So the last question on my end, if Yassin will allow me to just to take up a bit more of his time, but um, when we then take, when you then take that pulse and you find a, 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 a pulse finding, do you, do you find a pulse finding in the Tian system that, that tells you greater time or do you find a, a a finding that tells you guaja? Or do you find a a finding that tells you, oh, there's guaja and oh look, there's also Bai Shao, you can figure it out from there, or what exactly is happening? I don't know if we need the details, but just um just sort of understanding what's possible from the pulse and what isn't. Yeah, it's all of those, <clears throat> basically. Um so I don't know if you want me to give a fuller answer on the whole kind of herb method pulse idea um can you say that again i'm sorry i didn't quite hear you yeah i mean i don't know if you want me to give a fuller answer on the whole sort of myth the idea of the herb method and the pulse um, yeah i think i think um, if you can give us a little bit of information that would be that that would help to make things clearer yeah because this could kind of tie it back into what we were talking about last time about formulas and so on so say for example like because we i think we talked about ganjang like dry ginger and Li Jong Wan last time treating basically the, the cold digestion, the weakness of the center. So um if a pulse shows if there's a pulse finding which shows cold and weakness of the center, and we know we're going to treat that with ganjang, ganjang is the herb which provides what the body needs to restore that function, then again we know we're no longer going to go through those steps of diagnosing cold and weakness of the center from that pulse. And then saying that we need Ganjang, we're just going to call that a Ganjang pulse. So that tells us we need a Ganjang based formula. From that, we may feel that pulse and say this is a Ganjang pulse. We know that means cold and weakness sense. So we may ask one or two confirming questions like, do you have reduced appetite? Do you have a lot of you know bloating, loose stool? And we'll want the patient to confirm those questions, which then confirms the finding that we've we've had on the pulse. But then, yeah, then we basically reach the herb method. So the pulse will show the dysfunction that's happening in the body. As we use a few core archetypal herbs which revive that function, then we basically take the leap of that pulse means that herb rather than that pulse means that dysfunction, which then means we use that herb. So we take those steps out. So then if we feel that ganjang pulse, that means we're going to use a ganjang herb method. The formula we need to use is going to be primarily based around ganjang. Um, and if there's nothing else on the pulse, then it's going to basically be, you know, patient comes in, they may complain there's digestive issues. We feel a ganjang pulse. We know that's cold at the center. So we're going to use, you know, like a primary ganjang formula for the digestion, like Li Jong Wan. Now, that can be enough. The other thing is, you know, like certain formulas can have other pulses, which, so, so simple pathologies, the pulses will generally follow, you know, the herb methods because that dysfunction is showing it's relatively new in the body. So the body is just showing the, that dysfunction very clearly. So you can basically go off a primary herb. So for example, ganjang, then you may get a mixture of herb methods. Like you may feel a ganjang pulse and a greater pulse. So cold of the digestion and dysregulation of the surface body temperature or weakness of the heart. So then you may say, I've got a ganjang pulse and a greater pulse. So I'm going to need a formula, which has both those herbs in. 
So we'd use a formula like Grager Renshenteng, which is basically Li Zhongwen with Grager and slightly elevated Jurgenta. So that that's kind of covers two of the options you said of just primarily the herb method or two herb methods together. Um, or you could even have three herb methods or so, you know, so on, so on. Then you get to a point where certain formulas can also have just pulses which don't represent the herb methods. And this will often be when either when the that's gone on long term, it's become more complex and it becomes what we call a complex disease, which is where often there's multiple functions failing to the point where it's no longer defined by so much by a description of the pathology, but it takes on like a sort of disease of itself. And, you know, one good example is I always use is like the, the disease Li Jia Bing, which is digit and articulation disease, or basically like arthritic pain of the small joints. And in those, those pathologies, you know, it's already got so complex. It's something that's gone on for many, many years and you can no longer describe it by the path mechanism because there's so many path mechanisms going on that it becomes a disease in and of, of itself with the defined symptom picture and the pulses for for those formulas will we'll start to show something which is a bit different to the simple herb method pulses just because so many more pathological byproducts are built up you know you get a lot of room building up in the system which will suppress certain pulses um you may have like dry blood building up in other diseases which then changes the pulse a bit so there you can start to get those kind of key formulas showing slightly different pulses. Um, yeah. And that's just, it's just a case that like, again, you basically just have to learn your, you have to learn your basic curve method. You have to learn your basic formula pulses, but yeah, you can have all of those variations depending on what's going on. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Um, I'd like to ask about, um, Okay, so just to sort of lead into this question, you've talked about how the TN lineage is a clinical lineage, right? And we've talked about the pulse giving you an immediate feedback of what the body needs. So, I mean, we're getting a picture of how central the pulse is to this lineage. Um, and we've we've talked about, right, uh, the different bits about different uh, types of pulses, which is, as a patient, is, is, is has been thus far incredibly informative. Um, but also as a patient, I'm interested in how the pulse might work with um, other methods. Um, so how do they relate into each other? With you know the you also mentioned at the beginning when you were talking about different types, you know that there's different palpation points, um, the importance of smell and all that, but also of questioning. Um, so. We've touched on these a little bit already throughout the conversation, but if we could maybe address it implicitly, for instance, um, what if a practitioner were to find that um, um, something different in the in in the abdomen or or uh, yeah, let's start with that. What how would how, yeah? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Yeah, yeah. Um... So different systems will emphasize different methods. Some systems will use a combination of methods. Others will primarily use one over the other. So we do use questioning. We use some observation, um, but we primarily base things around the pulse. So basically the buck stops with the pulse. Um, you notice, for example, some schools of Japanese herbal medicine, um, traditional Japanese herbal medicine like Kampo, some schools there use both pulse and abdomen, but they it's not an absolute, but they use a general rule that pulse is better. They use pulse more for acute situations because it changes much quicker and so on. Abdomen more for chronic situations. Um, but the, the way we, we use the pulse is the pulse, like I said, the sort of buck stops the pulse. So fundamentally, the pulse shows us fundamentally what's going on. And then we would supplement that with other information. So the first thing is questioning, you know, like you feel a pulse and then, for every formula, or I should say for every mechanism, every diagnosis, which in our case is a formula, there are a few key fundamental questions. So you would feel a pulse and you would ask a patient some fundamental questions and you kind of want exacting yes, no answers from these. You want to ask the question in a way of, is it yes or no? Like you, you feel a pulse and you, for example, would ask, are you thirsty? Yes or no. And if the patient is thirsty, that would show one formula. If not, that could show a different formula. Or do you feel nausea? For example, if you felt a form a pulse for the formula chai hu gui jigan chen tang, chai hu gui jigan chen tang should have 
thirst and absence of nausea. So you could ask the patient, are you thirsty? They say yes. Or you could use your observation skills. You watch them gulping down water. They're probably thirsty. Uh, if you, um, yeah. And then you could ask them, you know, do you have nausea? Yes or no. If they say yes, then that's definitely not a chai hu guai jigen jing thing. You know, so you ask very exacting questions. You don't just run through a list of, of uh, you know, of what are known as the 10 questions. You ask really clear exacting questions based on the, um, based on the information you've got from the pulse. Now, we do use some abdominal diagnosis as a back of that, like the Shang the di abdominal diagnosis was clearly used in the Shanghan Lun. Like you see um, references to a, a glomus, a kind of feeling of fullness on the epigastrium over the stomach area. And in some lines, it says that it feels full, but, you know, when you press it, it's soft. And then there's other lines where it says, you know, the patient says they have abdominal fullness but the doctor can't find any fullness so there's clearly references to abdominal palpation and we we do integrate systems of abdominal palpation also in you know in the, in the more modern tian lineage dr tian didn't really do it so much um but we we do now and we've we've kind of used that we've constructed that from japanese campus systems because they use it a lot and from the references in the shankan learn and that that helps back up our our diagnosis so for example if we feel a Forming that would have a, a glomus or a pee on the epigastrium, like fullness in the epigastrium, then we may lay the patient down and feel their epigastrium to see if it is indeed full. If not, then we would have to conclude that it could be another thing that that pulse could indicate. So the, in that case, the abdomen would help confirm what we um, what we felt on the pulse. Or, for example, if there's gynecological issues, if a woman has a lot of gynecological issues, they could have a lot of blood stasis that's you can feel that to a certain extent on the pulse but it's very very clearly palpable on the abdomen and the other thing is you it is true like you do see long-term change on the abdomen so that can also give you an idea of not necessarily what needs treating now but what could need treating in the future so you'd sort of combine all methods but it's all on from our perspective it's all on the base of what's shown on the pulse other systems may use other methods other systems may be primarily abdominal diagnosis based or primarily observationally based and then may use other other methods as a backup um, but we we often kind of like i say we use the pulse as our primary and we use other other methods to differentiate or confirm okay that um i'd like to follow that up with something that feels slightly mischievous just because mm. we're going still in this direction of pulse versus other methods um but we do uh, you know we do live in a digital age you know we've we've all just come not just but you know we've recently we've, we've, we have covid behind us and self-isolation and all of that and as a patient i've actually seen not in the tn lineage but in other lineages practitioners offering you know even prime first um sessions online um now is that then not something um that can be done um with 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 a with such a clinically oriented pulse orientated um lineage or or um is it something that could be done for follow-up sessions or what then what would one do essentially if one can't feel the pulse is basically what i'm asking but wants to treat a patient that is essentially the question yeah i mean you've, you've got to do what you can so it's like yeah during covid during some of the lockdowns we had in this country, I had to close my clinic, but I still saw people over the phone or online. Um, it's not always going to be as as easy. Basically, you have one less diagnostic tool. So the one thing is that I found over the years of practicing pulse is that then my questioning got very, very focused. So already when a patient walks in if they have a main complaint that will point you to certain areas some main complaint you know some main issues could happen in any pretty much any pathology they're very generic others are a bit more specific so from that point you may already be thinking certain things and then you just have to go off key diagnostic questions really and try and try and form a conclusion there just with that one less bit of information but i have found that again um practicing this kind of classical method is actually helped me a lot with my um with being more concise and more clear and more direct with my questioning and that's one thing again i don't mean this to be a criticism but i i find nowadays people aren't really taught to question patients very well i mean i still remember this from my training like 
there's this idea that you have what are known as the 10 questions. Um, I forget at what period throughout history these were standardized, but, you know, things like, you know, you ask about body temperature, sweating, appetite, bowels, so on. You And often when you start studying, when you see patients, you know, see in clinic and later when practitioners go out to practice, they'll often have this in their, their intake forms. You know, they just have all these categories. There's more than 10 questions, but they have all these categories and they just run through all of them. The problem there is you get a load of unstructured information. And what you really need to do is you classical medicine is not about getting a massive amount of information it's about getting the right information and the right detail that you need and then stopping there so ensuring you can be focused and also ensuring you can be safe but then not getting a lot more information because actually the risk is if you end up getting too much information you end up confusing and distracting yourself and you end up getting um that useless information essentially so you don't need to go through you know the full 10 questions in every patient and when you do question a patient it should be in a structured way every question you ask should have a reason to it and you should know exactly what you are doing with the answer to that question so I remember a while ago I sort of just for kind of a, a lecture we we're doing on, on the diagnostic process I structured questions into different categories and I was like Obviously, after you've asked, what do you want treatment for? You know, what's your main complaint? After that, your question should be, first of all, confirming questions. So whether you take the pulse or not, they should be <clears throat> clear, succinct questions, which get you one way or another. So you have a main complaint. You want to first differentiate, is it this or this? You know, you want to, you want to basically go through this <clears throat> clinical flow of gradually narrowing in to different areas. So is it excess deficient? Is it hot? Is it cold? Is it this system? Is it this system? So you want your first few questions to be you know do you get this or this yes or no and it, it needs to be structured in a way that a patient kind of has to answer yes no or don't know and then don't know you have to try something else but you don't want you want your question to be structured so a patient has to give a yes no answer or so you can at least interpret a yes no answer from it and that yes no answer should take you down one clear path or another and your next question should then be refining from there and then your next question refining from there you know very much like a sort of flow chart um, the problem is if you just run three questions, you're not going to get structured information. You'll get information you don't need. Um, so yeah, the first category of questions should be kind of confirming or denying questions. The next one should be sort of eliminating questions. So like I say, you know, formula chai hu gui jigan jang tang, that pathology should not have nausea. So you can ask about nausea and that will immediately eliminate that possibility from your mind if the patient has nausea. So the, the kind of subcategory of the confirming question is eliminating questions. And then after that, you should really be reaching your diagnosis. That should be all you need to do to reach your, your diagnosis at that moment in time. And then you can ask other questions. So you, you can ask questions to fill in details. So, for example, I don't know, if a woman comes in with, um, a, let's say, like headaches, which have no relation to a menstrual cycle, you know, they're random times throughout the month, you may take the pulse, determine what your diagnosis is. You've already written a formula, but then you may ask about the regularity of the menstrual cycle. You may ask about other things which aren't related at this moment in time, but just to fill in the rest of the details, so you know what's going on with the patient. And then you may have a category of questions which are you consider your research. So you may have noticed when you prescribed this formula the last three times, patients seem to have, I don't know, their little toes seem to be turning blue. I don't know, something like that. So then you notice that that in a few patients with the same formula. So you may just ask your other patients that, and it just has nothing to do with the clinical process. Now you're just doing a bit of research. And if you notice a hundred or so patients with that formula have that symptom, you can start using it as a useful differentiating system later. But at that moment in time, you realize you're just collecting information that has no influence on what you're doing. So there's those different categories of questioning. That's sort of how you should structure it. It's clear. First of all, you know, confirming and denying questions get you to a clear endpoint. Then once that's done, and that shouldn't be a lot of questions. You know, if you, if in your first three questions in clinic, you're kind of not clear, your questioning is not clear enough. I mean, there's always going to be patients, I admit, you know, you're always going to get one or two really complex patients where you have to go through a lot longer process. But that's, you know, that's one or two out of 20. In 90% of your patients, if you're not really, really clear about, you know, the, the general ballpark of what your treatment will be within three, three or so questions, you're, you're kind of, 
your, your questioning is not focused enough. So that's your first category, that kind of confirming, denying questions. And after that, filling in background, gauging progress as well, um, and research. Because you also need to know, like, gauging progress. You know, a patient comes in, has headaches. You could say, how would you score your headaches on a scale of 1 to 10, you know, the pain? That may not have no determining factor in your diagnosis, but it just means when the patient comes back, if previous headaches were an 8 out of 10, if now they're a 4 out of 10, you can put something on it. Or like, what do your headaches stop you from doing in life? It's a way to gauge progress, but it has no bearing whatsoever on what you prescribe. So, yeah, you, you basically ask questions to confirm or deny a diagnosis, and that's a diagnosis bit done. Then your other categories would be gauging progress, just filling in the background for future reference, and also um, your own sort of research. So... Yeah, to come back to your, your question, like I found, yes, this is a pulse diagnosis lineage and it would be ideal to have the patient there with the pulse. But, you know, in this world, we, we can't always do that. I would say treat a lot of patients who travel a long way. You know, I have a lot of patients who are in other countries who are a long way outside of London. So I, I just can't see them as regularly. Um, I was, so, yeah, like during COVID, I had to, when I couldn't see patients, I had to go through questioning, more structured questioning, but I did find the structure that I got over years and years of practicing this way, you know, feeling a pulse and asking yes, no questions from there. I found that helped me much more when I didn't have the pulse. Um, and I find now, often when I have patients coming from a long distance, um, if I need to follow up with them a bit more regularly, you may do it via email or via phone. And if I already have an idea of their pulse, I have an idea of where things should and shouldn't go. So I can, again, form a kind of structured assessment based off that. It's never, you know, I don't think any of us can pretend it will ever be as as good as, as having all the diagnostic tools open to you. But, you know, that's just, that's life, isn't it? You've got to, it's yeah. never, never going to be perfect. So that's kind of how you'd work with it. And this is also another thing like, Sometimes you hear people say, well, what about when people have deviated radial arteries? So, you know, the radial artery, rather than running here, it runs up over here. I mean, that's 1% of people. But sometimes people like, or it's like, well, you can't just rely on the pulse. What if they have a deviated radial artery? And it's like, well, A, that's 1% of the people. So I can still treat 99% of the people. And if, if I can treat 99% of the people, then I'm very happy with that. Second, I've actually never found that to be a problem. I've always found... People have brought people to me and said, oh, they've got a radi you know, deviated radial artery. And I've just put my fingers along the line of the pulse and have often been able to find something along that line. So use that diagnostically and kind of found that fine. But say if you can't find anything, if they or if they've had their radial artery removed, which some people have surgery, surgically, um, you then just have to, in those small instances, you need to rely on other information. So then abdomen observation and so on. You would rely on the other supplementary methods rather than the pulse but again from the the skills you've developed from working clearly and systematically from the pulse that means that does often make you much more focused even when you can't rely on the pulse well that it sounds like that's also uh related to your understanding of how the formulas um correspond to physiology mm. you know that you're thinking i mean use the example of trigradial ganjang tang um and nausea and i suppose it's the because uh, we had this conversation actually uh, the uh, Tianhua Fan and the nausea relationship. And so you're trying to differentiate based on what is going wrong because you understand mm. those units of physiology and how they correspond to certain herbs. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. And, yeah. Uh, do you find, this is a tangential question, so maybe we don't want to take too long on it, but I can't resist as a patient because I've, I've, I have these chronic issues, right? And um, when I first started going, it honestly was just a relief you know, I had I had like a bunch of things go wrong with me in, uh, when I was in my early 20s. Um, and I went to um, a Western uh, medical doctor in London, actually. I was living there at the time. And it, it, even then, which I, had, I did not know anything about Chinese medicine then or anything about alternative medicine or anything, I could not believe the approach the, that they had to these sort of issues which are admittedly chronic and vague and weird right yeah. uh, but it was like you have three things go wrong with you you know and they don't they don't you know they treat them as though they're completely separate issues and i'm like but i'm sitting in the same body so and they all happened at the same time that seems like a remarkable coincidence um so part of the experience as a patient at the beginning of going to a to a chinese medicine practice one of the things that was satisfying to me was that somebody actually was listening to what i was saying 
Um, but the longer that I've been a patient, actually, the less I want to talk, you know. Um, and I don't know if if this kind of approach, I, you know, I'm really just curious, this kind of approach where you're checking the pulse and you're really asking very simple, straightforward, differentiating questions. Do your patients want more than that? You know, are they just like, that's fine as long as I get better? Or are they like, I would like to tell you about what's going on? Because you hear that a lot sometimes. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I do think it's important not to, you know, dismiss patients, dismiss their experience. And a large, you know, a large part of it, it the therapeutic relationship is, is that is not just, you know, telling patients to shut up and <laughs> take this pill, you know. Um, but that's where you have to separate your diagnostic part of the brain and your part of just interacting with another human being um because you can have a long long conversation with somebody and they can tell you a lot about the you know the issues they're having but that doesn't necessarily give you diagnostic information so it's not that you you know if you practice this and you'll never talk to another patient again it's just more that you don't need to use that for the diagnostic part of what you do and this actually means you know if if you ask, you know, if you if you have practice based a lot around talking to a patient, so on, it can free you up for that. Because some some people, like some practitioners, are not very talkative, and they will often attract patients who don't want to talk a lot as well. And some practitioners really do a lot of you know talking, and so on, and they'll attract patients who will want to talk a lot. Um, and but both are fine. But the thing is, like, first thing I think is important is that the way we you've got to be clear that if you're offering acupuncture or herbs or so on that that is ultimately what you have to do you know it's i i don't necessarily think it's if if you want to be a you know a, a therapist a talking therapist you should train in that and i think there's safety issues around around that as well like i i worry sometimes that some practitioners try to be talking therapists without adequate training and with certain patients i think that's quite dangerous um, so I think, first of all, if you want to be primarily a talking therapist, you should train in that and you should advertise as that. You shouldn't then advertise as a Chinese medicine practitioner. But the second thing is, even if, you know, there's, it's it's good to offer a bit, to listen to patients, to offer a bit of support and so on, because that is an important part of, of all, like sometimes just being listened to can help a lot. But that's a separate thing for diagnosis. So, for example, when I'm talking to a patient, um, you know, I'm, I'm not a massively talkative practitioner as well. Um other, other people maybe but I'm when even when I'm talking to a patient that what they're saying that I don't necessarily use as diagnostic information so say if a patient comes in with a problem let's say somebody has you know chronic fatigue and body aches and it's really affecting their life like it can really profoundly affect your life now they've told me they have severe fatigue and body aches that's the diagnostic criteria that I need if they then, if we then go and have a conversation about how it's affecting their life, we can have you know a long conversation about that. And that, but at that point, I probably switch the diagnostic part of my mind off. Fatigue and body aches is the diagnostic information I've got. Add that to a pulse, and that'll often get me to a formula. Um, you know, that's kind of it. And then I'd ask how you about you know daily bowel movement and so on, just to see what's going on in the interior and so on. And then I've reached. And I'll have often written a form in my mind or even on the pad, and then I can continue talking to the patient. And then I can have a genuine conversation with the patient without trying to get diagnostic information. And another thing you see is a lot of practitioners talking about, like, you know, how do I get a patient? Like the patient doesn't want to answer questions, doesn't want to do this. And, you know, you experience this a lot. Like what the information you want to get is not necessarily what the patient wants to talk about this is a way around it. You can relax completely. You can get the diagnostic information very quickly. And even while a patient's talking, if they're talking a lot, you can say, while they're talking, can I take your pulse? You can take their pulse. And I often do this a lot of having chats to my patients, taking their pulse. We'll be talking about something else. And then I'll just be like, huh, is your urine much darker this week? Yeah, it has been. Okay. And how, you know, how was your holiday? You know, and that kind of thing. So it's like, you can do it very, it, it basically just enables you to focus on diagnosis. And then that frees you up to do other things you know interact with the patient so on that's uh, yeah that's i mean yeah that's a fascinating thing um do you remember the first time i mean i'd like to uh 
you remember the first time that you got a really clear read on a pulse just when you were learning and um i would like to know just you know you can you don't have to go into too much depth into it but i'd like to know how that felt to be able to clearly understand what you need to do with a patient the first time hmm. so. yeah um yeah I, I can remember a few um actually i'll tell you another story first like the first time i met my teacher and saw what pulse diagnosis could do as well uh, yeah. i'll come back to your question in a minute but i remember like i had had just like my hope i started studying like my I was 19, met my teacher when I was about 22, I think. And just the whole of my life up to that point, I'd had severe insomnia. Um, like severe, like two, three hours sleep a night. Like if I got more than that, that was a good night. And that was constant. So it was really bad. And I'd like, I had had acupuncture from various practitioners, you know, in generally in the student clinic, because that's all I could afford. <laughs> I'd taken herbs. I hadn't really done much and at that point my my kind of expectation of Chinese medicine was it didn't really do much but I, I was kind of training it so I was going to complete the training and so on and then like I said you know I met my teacher started listening to him in a lecture and I'd already had these questions come up and you know was kind of very drawn to what he was teaching and then at the end of the like the first lecture he was treating like you know he had talked a lot about pulse diagnosis so people were naturally going up and saying can you take my pulse um and I, I did this, so I went up and said it, and he took my pulse, and he was just started taking it. He goes, you're not sleeping, are you? And I was like, no, <laughs> no, not at all. And then he just poked me in the stomach. It's like, you need to be needled there in, like, REN14, like, basically on the stomach. And I thought back, and I was like, yeah. Um, all through my life, I remember I'd always, like, my, my stomach, my upper abdomen would actually stick out a lot of the quite bloated, and the rest would be um, relatively flat. <laughs> not so much the case now. But um, <laughs> but then he he wrote a formula, Gansel Shishintang, added Guaja. And I just started taking it. I didn't think anything. I didn't really expect anything from it. I had, hadn't really had much results with herbs up until then. But I just started taking this. And suddenly, about three weeks later, I suddenly realized I woke up one morning and I was like, I just woke up, which meant I slept. And I, I looked back and I realized for about the last week, I've been feeling sleepy in the evenings, going to bed and just waking up the next morning like I'd been sleeping. Right. And this is the first time and no, you know, severe night sweats and everything. And I was like, wow, that actually worked. And I looked back at all the forms I had taken you know, from the college that I got, and it was always like tonifying you, tonifying your chi and blood with loads of mind calming herbs and so on. And here somebody took my pulse and said, you've got a stomach issue. I'm going to give you a formula to treat the stomach. Um, and also identify the fact that I'm sleeping. But he didn't give me any mind calming herbs or any herbs to promote sleep. He just said, this is what's on your pulse. Oh, there's a digestive thing. I'm giving you this. And it worked like nothing else had. And I was like, that's like this is what this is the Chinese medicine that was promised to me, you know, working yeah. out what's going on in your body. Yeah. It's so that not, was it's not Swan Tao Ren time. It's right? never Swan Tao Ren time. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> right. right. Yeah. Well that's yeah, that's I find that yeah, I find that really interesting. Because that's not yeah. an I, I don't know. I hear Swan Tao Ren time. Every time I say I don't sleep, somebody says Swan Tao Ren time. And I, mm -hmm. I've taken Swan Tao Ren time and I have not slept any worse or any better. And so to me that I find that that formula very interesting. You're talking about Dr. Um, Arno first look. Arno, yeah, yeah, I know, yeah. Yeah, it's funny you mentioned Swan Tzu because it is actually a Jingwei formula um, yeah. for sleep, but it's very, very specific. It's for deficiency taxation with deficiency vexation. Somebody who's very taxed, very worn out through lifestyle um, factors, and they're, they've got deficiency vexation. So they're, they're basically so tired they can't sleep. And I don't know if, I'm sure most people who experience this have had They've been overworked for many, many nights and they're exhausted. But you go to bed and you're half asleep. You're just so restless because you're so tired that you can't get to sleep. It's for that situation. And it just does not work the rest of the time. Like Swan Ren is a herb. If you char it a little bit and so on, it will have a calming effect on the mind. And if you take massive doses, it can knock you out a little bit and so on. But really as a formula, Swan Ren tank works phenomenally in that very specific situation. But otherwise... It's just not that effective. And often in sleep, it is the stomach that's implicated. After that, you know, it's things like water metabolism issues, weakness of the heart on top, you know, heart kidney not communicating. There's so much else that has to go on first. And Swan Tzu Rentang will only treat that that person who's so exhausted they can't sleep when there's nothing else going on in the picture as well. And, you, you know, you can tell I'm, you know, I'm, I'm slagging off a, a Shankan for me, so it must be. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it must be. Yeah. 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 <laughs> 
um, okay. And then well, when was the time that you you felt that, oh, there it is. I've got a proper read on this pulse. Um, yeah. Yeah. I've got to say it was almost straight away. Um, huh. It was a patient I treated kind of, so I met, I met Anna while I was still at, while I was still studying herbs for my last like six months, a year or so. And at that point, I just switched straight away from from hearing talk. First time I was like, right, I'm practicing Shanghai learning. He talked a bit about pulses and herb methods. And there was a patient I was treating in a student clinic with erectile dysfunction. Um, and up until then, you know, I've been following the advice of my lecturers and we've been working. Like basically, we'd all see a patient together. One practitioner would take the case in front of everybody else and we'd all come up with a group consensus on what it was. And I can't remember this form is something like and down with loads of yin tonics added and so on um and it just wasn't doing anything and then i like i went you know met arno for the first time in his first lecture and, and he talked about her methods and pulses and so on and then the next week i happened to see this guy in clinic and it's like no results so far i took his pulse and it felt like what would have been described as a dangue sinitang pulse now dangue sinitang is essentially a vasodilator it's a situation where you just have your blood is really really cold you're all your vessels deep and contracting. You basically have freezing cold hands and feet. You generally tend to feel cold. It's just a lack of warm blood circulation to the periphery. You know, it's a very common formula in this system for things like psoriasis, blood pressure issues, that kind of thing. Um, but I, I felt it. I felt his hands and feet there, freezing cold. Felt his pulse, and it was. It felt like what a dangue any tang pulse kind of should feel like. And I thought, huh, the blood isn't warming his extremities, his hands and feet. I wonder if it's not getting to the other extremity. You know, um, so I thought, well, you know, this will help get warm blood out there. And basically generation of erection is, you know, You're right. warm blood, it literally like without being caught creating wood, basically creating the wood <laughs> element, which is the rising of warm blood, right. <laughs> which it is, you know, it's, so it gave him this. And after like, and I was told, well, first of all, it was a big debate because the lecturer was like, well, no, this we you know, we're giving this other form like, but it hasn't worked. So, and then eventually because I'm quite a stubborn person, I was like, I'm giving this, and they're like, okay, we can give it for two weeks, and when it doesn't work, we go back to what I do. So I was like, okay. So he gave it for two weeks, and he came back, and it's already very positive results. So I was like, ah, this is good. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, and that that was kind of my first time. But then just after that, just going out into practice, I just found it very, yeah, just very helpful. Like when I was, I talk like. I chat a lot with, more with my patients now than I did back then. Like then I was just very much like, I just want to take the pulse. I don't want to talk. Like, I attract a lot of patients who kind of were sort of okay with that back then. But I, that was literally how I did it. I was like, what's wrong with you? Pulse. Okay. This isn't this. All right. Bang. Here's your formula. So yeah, I used it a lot. And I still remember as well as practicing, I would do, I'd take any opportunity to take as many pulses as possible when I was early on. So there's a point where I was working, I was like renting some clinic rooms in a place that was also a yoga studio. So then I would I would wait in the evenings. I'll go back in the evenings and sit between yoga classes and just wait with all the people that queue up and waiting for the yoga class, all the people coming out, I'd say like, let me take your pulse. And I'd just do this as my practice. Um, you know, just getting as many pulses as I could alongside actually treating my regular patients. And I remember one patient, I was feeling a pulse and I was like, I felt something which, you know, indicates some reversal from the stomach. So I was like, do you get any acid reflux? And she was like, nope, nope. But then it's like, sure. Like any pain burning on the stomach, any burning coming up here? Nope. Any funny, like sour taste in your mouth? Nope, not at all. So we're like, okay. Then. So we kept on chatting. And then a little while later, she said, oh, I'm on omeprazole, you know, an acid reflux drug. And I was like, oh, why are you on that if you don't get any acid reflux? I said, oh, well, I had this chest pain and it took my doctor, you know, four or five years to work out that this was reflux and then they put me on this um and it, the chest pain's not there and if i forget to take it the chest pain comes back and i was like oh no that must be you know what it was on your pulse and i said you know maybe we can do something with herbs to resolve that so you don't have to keep taking any meprosol and she just went no my doctor told me things like that wouldn't work and i was like ah um i, I just took your pulse within and within two minutes told you you had acid reflux and you said your doctor took four or five years to yeah. diagnose your chest pains after reflux and it's giving you something which when you stop taking it, it comes back you know maybe you know maybe that's a sign that you know that, that i can work at what's going on but she was like no nope, you said it won't work so it's like but that was like also a very early time where i was like yeah this clearly shows me what's going on in the person it's interesting because so her her pulse didn't change no because i it 
I think the Meprazole just suppressed the symptoms. It didn't stop mm. the mechanism. And all of this, um, I, I told you, we would skip it, skip this question, but I guess this is actually a good time to ask it. All of this did not take you uh, like 25 years with a Taoist master on top of a mountain, it sounds like. No, no. Um, I mean, like I said, I've been studying this system for 15 years, getting for 16 years now. Um, I started using it, started using the pulse from day one. Um, yeah, because I know this is always a thing. Like, there's people love this idea of mastery in Chinese medicine, and of, and yeah, mastering the pulse takes a lifetime. It really does. That mm -hmm. doesn't mean you have to be a master of it before you can use it. You can use it from day one. And th there's different pulse systems. Um, some look for really subtle findings and so on. The Tian lineage is actually a, a very straightforward pulse system very straightforward very simple like the it, it's one of those ones where it's like the building blocks are so straightforward and so simple and once you get those core building blocks down you can then go into the complexity of it but the building blocks are really 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 simple and straightforward you can really start using it from day one and actually you will never get good at it if you don't use it mm. like sometimes sometimes some people study and they're like i'm not sure if i'm going to apply this yet because i don't feel good enough at it and it's like you're never going to there like you just have to start doing it and you start doing it, you know, you start out gradually, you start diagnosing patients cautiously, you know, you get some support from somebody and then over time you get better and better. But like in our, like the way we teach people is through patient interaction. We do a lot of teaching clinics, you know, you learn the theory of the pulse and you have to memorize pulses, but then we just teach it by taking pulses and by treating patients, you know, we'll have very, very regular clinical training where we'll see, you know, 20 or so patients a day the you know they teach like I'll, I'll see a patient go through the regular process i would take pulse ask key symptoms write a formula then everyone else takes the pulse and you just do that again and again and again and we'll you know it's not in a mystical way of like i just write out the formula that's it i explain what the pulse is this finding here this finding here this indicates this bang and you just do that again and again and eventually your pulse taking will calibrate um, and it's it's literally a case of calibration. It's literally learning what I call wiry, and you just train yourself to recognize that as wiry. And I've trained myself to recognize what Arno saw as wiry, and Arno trained himself to recognize what Dr. Zeng saw as wiry. Um, very much, I don't know. Say, so if you're like learning to taste wine, you would taste a wine and say, This tastes of raspberries, <laughs> taste it. And you do that 10, 20, 100 times, and you get that, that tasting. And it's just literally like that. And we kind of, We've noticed over the years it takes roughly in you know in the region of four to six hundred pulses for somebody to become really calibrated, which mm. isn't long. There's just a few years of clinical training. And then we'll, you know, after that time, if people want, we can do a bit of a test where we both us and the student takes a pulse or takes a number of pulses and see if we come up with similar findings. And if so, that shows there's a decent degree of calibration. But you don't have to be calibrated to start using it in clinic. You can, like I say, you can start using it from day one and refine it from there. Because ultimately, you know, you got to work out if a patient is excess or deficient, is the pulse deep or not? You know, that's that's the first step. And you can get there very quickly. And So let, me, know, then, let me ask you this question explicitly then. I think you've already started to answer it. Hmm. On the one hand, we're saying mastery is one thing, but mastery of anything takes a very long time, yeah, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah um and and you've given us kind of an estimate estimate in terms of the number of pulses that need to be taken which i think is probably actually more useful than talking about time um yeah the 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 question that i have is like what are the stages of proficiency and so it sounds like you know you've already differentiated something you're like is this pulse excess is this pulse deficient mm -hmm. um how would you what are the stages of sort of refining that um if you're a student and you want to learn we already know you need to calibrate it with a teacher i'm a i'm a teacher by profession i think that's actually learning everything it should be like that um you need to stick with it for that four, 400 600 pulses and you need to be able to um fail it's mm. just you know yeah um as as you go through that process, there's stages of I suppose succeeding of sort of refining your your touch and maybe your understanding of what you're feeling. Could you just give us a couple of those stages? Yeah, um, 
I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm not sure if they are formalized stages. It will be very different for each person because some people are more tactile and people are very good at tactile things, can learn very quickly. And some people, especially if they've done a lot of pulse training in the past, can learn, you know, in the space of 100 pulses like, or, or even less. Like other people who are less tactile, like I'm, I'm actually not that good at tactile things, so it took me a while but other people are much quicker. So it's, yeah, I'm not really sure. I mean, if I was to say, if I was to tell people how to learn this, the first thing I'd say is, you know, one thing is you need to memorize the, the pulse information from a lineage perspective. You need to memorize what the herd methods are. You need to memorize the, the formula pulses. And that's just work you have to put in. Like it has to be in your mind. It has to be there when you're with the patient. You can't go and look it up after. And I think that's, people need to do more of that in Chinese medicine. Generally, they need to memorize their formulas. They need to have that information in them. Um, the next step, you need to learn what the pulse qualities are. So like what a wiry pulse is, um, what a slippery pulse is and so on. And then, yeah, it's just the case of feeling it. it. It is just very different for different people because some people will, sometimes you can feel a pulse, like you can feel what a wiry quality is. And some people will say this and they'll be absolutely spot on. They felt it once and it just stuck in their mind but it can take them three years to get a slippery pulse, you know, or other people can get a slippery pulse straight away. So some, sometimes some things just click for people, other times some things don't, and that'd be very different. So, yeah, I don't know what the formalized stages would be, but it's just, I think it's that process of um, memorizing the basic information so it's in you, so it's a part of you, memorizing the key qualities and what they actually mean. I think that's really important. Um, understanding that vessel tension does not have a great deal to do with vessel with with force or with depth because you hear this a lot like often there's often a lot of confusion like people say how can a wiry pulse be deep or how can a faint pulse be wiry well faint has to do with the force with which the beat's hitting your fingers wiry has to do with the tension of the vessel or at least in a tn lineage system it is other ones will say you know that what they will define a wiry pulse as a forceful pulse with tension whereas we you know it's different for us so people need to be Clear on that in their mind but after that yeah it's just a case of continuous practice and i think that's the thing continuous practice um and then in their clinics actually applying it because if you don't apply it it doesn't mean anything and that's also how you learn you can teach yourself a bit as well by applying this in patients you know feeling this pulse you feel a pulse you think oh maybe this is a sinisan pulse you ask the key diagnostic question for sinisan that kind of confirms it you give sinisan if it worked you've learned to send you samples and you do that again and again. That's kind of a bit of how I, I worked with it myself, but yeah, I'm not really sure how to put it in defined stages. I don't know if. No, it's actually, it's, it's, I, mean, I think that's a really good answer because um, like I said, I'm a teacher and I ask a question like that. And it's true that sometimes generally students at a certain age will have trouble with certain things, but not actually that useful for teaching uh, every student is going to have you know their own issues and that that like the ability to differentiate like as as each student is going to be able to pick up on that I think that's actually a very useful way of looking at that process so um sort of asked the, I should have known better than to ask that question no, um, no it's, it's a good, <laughs> good one but yes yeah, I think it's just so individual how you learn it so it is yeah, i actually build leading into that um or building off off of that um i feel like we've come to a point where so in in around these set of questions walid and i were having um uh, another conversation uh, because, uh, about this idea of you know what the pulse is is it an art or is it a science because i come across that in the literature right you know it's mm. i'm pushing for it you know it's an art it's a science and i get the feeling from the very start of this conversation to now that there really is this sense right so we've talked about what i mean if i could understand it if i have understood correctly and if one can understand it in this way is that the science is right each system has a different way of categorizing of understanding of signifying different um pulses seeing how that relates to processes and, and so on and so forth and so you know one has to understand that if they're to work within the system right and then we've been talking for the past several minutes about this idea of right you know this per is this person tactile right um 
uh, and sort of, you know, you, you just said it could take three years to click to sort of finally get your wiry pulse or what. And so there is this, so when I hear art, right, then you, I, I guess I think, right, this idea of, you know, experience that develops um, and also a sense of instinct. So that person who is tactile also has something, you know, come, you know, bring something to the table that maybe another practitioner has to work on. Um, and and then I guess then it seems to me now after we've had this conversation that it's such a it's it's not silly but it is silly to sort of go either this or that because it is the two of them just like you know you were talking about um, um, how you make your how your questions become so much more concise so much more you you know what you're looking for and that that relates to me as well to both art and the science and so it, it so yeah I, I i i've come to the I, I know i thought at the beginning an hour or so ago to you know um art and science art and science throughout this conversation i realized that it's it's neither this nor that that we are talking about both of them uh and it's so much clearer now how it is both of them um do you uh, i don't know if this is a question or maybe i mean do you do you agree do you uh, with with that um do you consider it as an art in that sense then perhaps as well yeah i mean absolutely yeah i think it's it is both and i think like in many ways medicine is is a science but clinical medicine is kind of an art with it is a mixture of art and science because i mean it, any experience well i would hope any experienced western medical physician would say this as well i mean it's like there are aspects of it which are exact science, but in clinical practice with human beings, they're so complex. There's so many variables to take into account that that's where the sort of art comes in and that's where the aspect of experience and so on comes in. Um, I always think about it like, you know, say if you're, um, if you're doing a double-blind randomized controlled trial on a, a new painkiller and it blocks an exact um, nerve pathway which transmits pain, you know, if that does that, that should have a hundred percent result in a in a clinical trial. If it returns seventy percent success rate, that's a phenomenal success rate. But why did it not do that in a hundred percent of people? And it's those variables, that variable in the thirty percent, which is what brings the art aspect into clinical practice. That's what makes it. That's what makes clinical practice difficult for a start, and that's what mean makes it. You know, not just like learning protocols and things you have to take into account all the variables with with all individual patients and yeah this is this is where it comes down to all of all of the stuff you learn after you've learned the basic theory the basic treatments and so on the rest of that is learning that art of clinical practice so it's definitely both the the key the course structure you should learn and the methodology you go through is a scientific process but then the art comes in applying that to the you know just the insurmountable number of variables you see in human beings um, and their differing circumstances. And that's where the two have to come together.